Boa tarde. É muito bom estar aqui. Um, unfortunately, those are the last words that you will hear of your beautiful language. My wife is uh, Portuguese, and she's very angry at me that all I speak is restaurant Portuguese. You know, bacalhau, pesteiro, tenata, povo. Um, but I am delighted to be here. Um, and I love Brazil, and I come here a lot. I'd like to try and convince you in the next 45 minutes that most of what we know about marketing is wrong and is changing. And I'm going to start at about 90,000 feet and give you the big picture on some changes that are happening in the world that affect marketing. Before I do that, right now, at this moment, I have 49,999 followers on Twitter. So the next person to be my 50,000th follower, I will send you a signed copy of Macroeconomics. I'm at DTapscott, at DTapscott on Twitter. And that was excellent timing of the Twitterverse to enable me to say that to you today. It was very nice of them. Um, let me start by going back a few years. Some of you may have seen a book I wrote called Wikinomics. And um, Wikinomics was about the corporation. And we argued that the internet is not about eyeballs, stickiness, clicks, page views, dot coms, hooking up online. It's a new global collaborative platform. It's a big computer that we all use. And this is leading to a profound change in the corporation as talent can now be outside our boundaries and customers can be inside. We argue that this is changing the deep structure and architecture of the firm and of how we orchestrate capability to create goods and services. And um, the book did very well. It was actually the best-selling management book in the United States for the whole year in 2007, and then something happened. We had the meltdown of the financial industry. Who would have imagined five years ago, that one of the big themes of management books and business magazines and so on today would be how to save capitalism. Or is capitalism even savable? And these books are not being written by Occupy types, they're being written by the capitalists. Do you know this uh, Nobel Prize winning economist, his name is uh, Paul Krugman? He writes for the New York Times. And for some reason, I've spoken at the same event as him recently. And Krugman gets up and he says, when you have the meltdown of a financial, financial industry, you get a prolonged period of slump. He said, Japan had one in 1992, and they're still in a slump. So get ready for a couple of decades of ugliness in the global economy. And that's the good news scenario, he says, because some really bad things can happen, like Spain or Italy defaults on its sovereign debt, the euro collapses, Europe goes into a depression, the whole global economy goes into a depression. So I get up on the stage and I look out at this big audience and everyone's sort of in a fetal position. And um, I say, look, far be it from me to debate a Nobel Prize winning economist but I have a different view. I think that the future is not something to be predicted. The future is something to be achieved. And we can achieve a very different future in the world than the one that Krugman outlines. But to do that, we need to know what the problem is. And the problem doesn't fall within the paradigm of traditional economists who worry about things like the business cycle. You know, are we double dipping in the cycle? This is not a cycle. This is not a secular change that we're going through. It's a punctuation point in human history. Arguably, what's happening today in the world is that the industrial age has finally come to an end. And you can look around everywhere and see a whole, this is the topic of um, macroeconomics, you can see a whole set of institutions that are in various stages of being stalled or frozen or failing, contrasted with the contours of a set of sparkling new initiatives that show the way forward. 
So the in upper left there, the industrial age corporation typified by General Motors, America's greatest company, it went bankrupt. The financial system, the core modus operandi of Wall Street almost brought down the global capitalist system. It hasn't changed. The newspaper, the last newspaper in Brazil will be published in the year 2030. You know, newspapers are not needed anymore. One young person that we talked to said, if the news is important, it will find me. I don't know about you, but Twitter is my newspaper. I organize it into different sections, like a newspaper. And I create my own newspaper. How we solve global problems is changing. The universities and the schools. I mean, we have the very best model of teaching in our schools all around the world that 17th century technology can provide. Now, all of these institutions are based on an industrial age model. And that's where the model of marketing came from. The model was mass production, mass distribution, mass media, mass marketing, mass education, where something at the top controlled products, services, TV shows, advertisements, messages, and they pushed them out in a standardized way to passive recipients. So they pushed out radio shows and, and uh, lectures. And I love the lecture. Yeah. To me, the lecture is the process whereby the notes of a lecture go to the notes of a student without going through the brains of either. <laughs> now, I appreciate the irony that I'm standing up here giving you a lecture. <laughs> but this is actually not a good way of learning. I'm just trying to convince you of about two ideas. But nobody's going to remember the 16 institutions or the five principles or the four new themes of marketing that I tell you. Lectures are one way, they're one size fits all, and the recipients are passive in the learning process. We need to change that. So this is a time of great change and of great transformation. If you think about marketing, marketing is changing as part of a new and changing world. Now, before I get into it, I want to take you up even one level. I think if you want to understand what's happening today, you don't go back to, with respect to Paul Krugman, to 1982 or even the Great Depression. You need to go back earlier. All around the world, hundreds of years ago, many countries, a hundred years ago or fewer, there was an agrarian economy. And the political system was called feudalism. All across Latin America's, America, there were colonies. And they were controlled by the kings and nobilities and the church of feudal powers. And knowledge was tightly concentrated in tiny oligopolies. People just didn't know about things. And along comes Johannes Gutenberg and his great invention. And over time, different parts of the population began to acquire knowledge. And when they did, the institutions of feudal society appeared to be stalled or frozen or even failing. It didn't make sense for the church to be responsible for medicine when people had knowledge. It didn't make sense for a bunch of kings in Portugal to be running this large territory in Latin America. So all around the world, we had these transformations that occurred, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, Bolivar, and eventually, we saw the rise of the nation state, of parliamentary democracy, of science, the university, of the corporation, commercial relationships, capitalism, the printing press evolved into new media, radio and television. We saw the rise of a whole advertising industry and it was all good. It advanced our standard of living. But now once again, the technology genie is out of the bottle and this time it's very different. The printing press gave us access to the written word. The internet enables each of us to be a publisher. The printing press, radio and television gave us access to recorded knowledge and content. The internet gives us access to that, but more important to the intelligence contained in the crania of other people on a global basis. This is not an information age. You hear that term? I don't think it is. It's an age of collaboration. 
It's an age of the networking of human intelligence. Okay, so thank you for being patient. Let's bring it down to earth. Why is this happening? Well, first of all, we have the rise of the new media. And the social web is very different than your daddy's internet, okay? You access it through billions, soon trillions of inert objects that become smart communicating devices. My hotel room here in Sao Paulo, the door has a chip in it and everything, there are, it's internetworked and it's a relatively new um, door. So I'm guessing the door has an IP address. The door is an internet appliance. I had a camera stolen from a hotel room in Miami and the door knew about me. It knew who'd been in and out of the room. We found an unauthorized access. I have a friend in Toronto. Everything in his house that has electrical power has an IP address. And all these things talk to each other. I have no idea what his refrigerator says to his toaster. But uh, he was bragging that his fence talks to his sprinkler system. And I said, well, Ken, why would you care? He says, Don, if a burglar comes over the fence, the sprinkler is my first line of defense. So this is pervasive ambient computing. We've got the rise of broadband mobility brought to you by some interesting new players like Google. We have geospatiality. The old web, you surfed websites. The new web, you surf the physical world. Google Glass. You've got the rise of true multimedia. The old web is about data, text, voice, and image. And all of this is becoming integrated. So. That's a huge change. And in Brazil, 100 million users online, 20 million have broadband. Smartphones are selling faster than regular phones now. There are 51 million of them. 86% of smartphone users um, access the internet every day. And there are 6 billion videos watched per month in Brazil on YouTube. Brazil loves video. And e-commerce continues to grow very rapidly. I mean, um, uh, 12.7 12, 12 billion of revenue in the first quarter of 2013. That's 24% growth. 24% growth per quarter. I mean, this is huge stuff. 46 uh, million e-consumers now in Brazil. That's half of the entire population on the internet. Uh, M-commerce growing at 3.6 a month. This is going to take off. And the average price is around 360 um, Reyes per, uh, per transaction. So that's a huge factor. Now the second big change is that we have the rise of a new generation. Who here is under the age of 33? Would you put up your hands, please? Okay, that's great. Who has children under the age of 33? Anybody? Okay. Well, I could be brief about this topic because you young people are the first generation to come of age in the digital age. Now, I started studying your generation about 20 years ago when I noticed how my own children were effortlessly able to use all the sophisticated technology. And at first I thought, my children are geniuses. They're prodigies. And, but then I noticed that all their friends were like them. So that's a bad theory. So um, I started working with 300 kids, and I wrote this book back in 1997. Flash forward today, you're not just growing up digital, you've grown up. You're coming into the workforce, into the marketplace, and into society. And as a consumer, you're completely different. You may not know it, but you are. And if you understand those differences, you'll understand a big theme about how marketing is changing, because in your culture is the new marketplace. It's also the new workplace as well. Now let's just do some demographics here. In the United States, this is the biggest generation ever. It's called the echo. The echo of the baby boom. And the echo in America is 80 million youngsters. There are only 78 million baby boomers. So based on your demographic muscle alone in the US, you'll dominate the 21st century. And what makes you a force for change? Well, you're the first generation to grow up digital. Now, you see this cartoon here? Nobody even chuckled 
when I put it up. This is a cartoon from Grown Up Digital in 1997. When I used to put this cartoon on the screen, people would fall off their chair. They would be laughing so hard. A baby using a computer. <laughs> Today, everybody looks at it like, what is that weird thing there? I mean, why doesn't the kid have an iPad or a <laughs> tablet or something like that? But there's such an important point here. Time online for these kids growing up is not taken away from hanging out with your friends, learning the piano, talking to your parents, doing your homework. Time online is taken away from television, correct. The baby boomers, my generation, watch 24 hours a week of television in the US. Perfect for mass media, mass communications and advertising. Today, they watch less TV and they watch it differently, right? I mean, think about yourself. You come home, you turn on your TV, and you start... No, you come home, you turn on your laptop, and you're on a mobile device, and you're texting, you've got three magazines open, and a video game going. Those of your students, you're doing the homework at the same time. And the television's in the background. The television is like Muzak. And this is not bad for kids. Like people say, it's good. I'm, I'm going to be around for the next day and a half. I'd be happy... That statement I just said, it's good, that comes from a $4 million research project where I interviewed 11,000 young people in 10 countries, including Brazil. This is not bad, if you do it right. Now, um, let me just, uh, what's going on here? No, we, that's very, very strange. We're missing some slides. Anyway, um, I'm hoping we have the right deck. We'll find out in a second. So, this is very humbling. And um, this is a panel. I do these uh, panels of young people sometimes. And um, this was at the World Congress on Information Technology. There's 7,000 people in the audience. On the left there is Rahaf Harfouche. She's born in Syria, studying in Paris. Her boyfriend is in Toronto. And so they turn on video Skype all day long to keep the relationship going. I asked her, your generation, do you use email? She said, no, m email is yesterday's technology. And I said, well, your generation, if you did use email, what would you use it for? And she says, email is sort of like a formal technology, say, for sending a thank you letter to one of your friend's parents. That would be a good use of email. Beside her is Alison Featherstone. She's the 15-year-old daughter of Brian Featherstone. And Allison um, gets paid $25 a month as an allowance. She has to you know, make her bed and do stuff. But one of the things she has to do is um, monitor her use of media, how much time she does what and what and what. It's now called the Allison Diaries. She's got 150 kids around the world doing this. The reason that Brian has asked her to do this is that he noticed when she's watching television, she's cutting out the advertisements, time shifting. And if you're the head of an, uh, of an ad agency, that's the scariest thing you've ever seen. Beside her, Sherry Kong, 20-year-old student from New Zealand. She's been hired along with 80 other students by the government. Their job, to teach the teachers how to use the internet in the classroom. <laughs> I asked her, Sherry, what are the teachers like? As students, she says, the teachers, they're awful students. They talk in class. They don't do their homework. I have to get, I'm sending out pink slips all the time. And beside her is Michael Furtick. He's the, the oldest of them all. He was 28 at the time. Um, I've known Michael since he was 13 years old when he was the project manager on my website, growingupdigital.com. They made him the project manager because he was the oldest and most sophisticated um, on the team. When Michael was 15, he sold his own website for several million dollars. And uh, one of the news reports said it was probably only a million. And I sent him an email, Michael. I said, Michael, you sold it for a million dollars. You should have called me. And he wrote back and he said, Don, legally, I can't tell you how much I sold it for, but I can tell you I'm very happy. <laughs> and um, so, I think we fear what we don't understand. If we understand this generation, we can build effective institutions and effective marketing. Now, if you're building a marketing campaign, these are the eight norms of the generation. 
build it around these eight norms. You want to give customers freedom. For example, freedom of choice. Choice is like oxygen. I had three TV stations when I was a kid. Today, you have millions. They want to customize everything. How can they customize your product and your service? I, I never got to customize the Mickey Mouse Club on television when I was a kid, but today young people can change everything. They're a generation of scrutinizers. You're going to be naked as a company, so you better get used to it. If you're going to be naked, there are some conclusions that flow from that. One is, if you're going to be naked, fitness is no longer optional, or you've got to get buff. You know, you've got to be a good company. When I was a kid, I saw a picture. It was a picture. These kids, what is it? Animation, bot, Photoshop, morph? Generation with integrity and very strong values. How do you build integrity into your corporate brand and image? They want to collaborate. I grew up being the passive recipient of TV. These kids have grown up interacting. How can you build communities rather than trying to sell stuff? You build communities and you sell stuff as part of an engagement and a relationship. They love to have fun. You know all those videos that we've seen earlier that are so funny in marketing? Fun is part of everything for them. You know, 52% of them in the U.S. said having fun is as important as what the product or service does. How do you have fun with Kleenex? You know, how do you have fun with a mortgage? I don't know. You have to figure it out. Generation uh, that wants speed. They want things to happen quickly. And they're a generation of innovators. So, technology, demographics, and that creates a social revolution. Oh, so here we go. Um, these are called population pyramids. You know what these things are? Um, this is 100 years old, 0 years old, 50 years old. So this is Italy. Look at the big middle-aged bulge in Italy. When I was in Italy recently, I said, who here is under the age of 33. No hands went up. I said, who has children under the age of 33? No hands went up. I was very tempted to say, you know what? Why don't we just end my speech right here? Go home, have a bottle of wine, put on some nice music, <laughs> light a candle, make some babies. <laughs> you know? This is China. Look at, not a lot of young people because of the one birth policy. This is the United States, the baby boom and the echo of the boom. Wow, South Korea, big middle age population. Look at Iran. You know why things are so explosive in Iran? They have the biggest proportion of teenagers and 20 somethings to the rest of the population of any country in the world. That's India. You know, a plurality of young people in the world are in India. Now, what's Brazil like? It's pretty good. Well done. Your parents did a good job. Um, because having a youthful population is so important for the future. Now, um, because of this, we have the rise of a whole set of collaborative communities. And it's not just there are a billion people on Facebook. But social networking is now becoming social production. And this is a new age where people can self-organize. Now let me just tell you a quick story on this. This is about six years ago, and somebody sent me an email saying, there's this guy named Obama. He's trying to get the Democratic nomination. Do you know that he thinks your book, Wikonomics, is the key to getting elected and to changing America? Go to mybarackobama.com. So I went there, and there's my book. It's right on the screen. It says, we believe in the principles of collaboration and the use of the internet in every way possible, and the use, and the book by Don Tapscott, and he's saying, I'm asking you to believe not just in my ability to bring about real change in Washington, I'm asking you to believe in yours. And I looked at this thing, and, well, my first reaction was, I am the man. But not so fast, Don, because it turns out I'm not the man. Because I went there, there's a Wikonomics community, there's also a single moms for daycare community.
community. And there's a Young Firefighters for Obama community. He created a platform whereby 35,000 communities self-organized, and that's what brought them to power. They raised over $100 million. Self-organization is this huge force. Now, it's a force for a better society. Um, this is something that's going on right now in um, Brazil. Do you know about this? Imagina la Copa, using all of the energy and unhappiness even around the, the World Cup to try and mobilize young people to get involved in communities and building a better uh, Sao Paulo. And uh, this is a, but this is an example of one of these self-organizing networks um, where young people are deeply engaged. If you're a, a CPG company, great idea to get involved with a project like this. Because if we don't, well, the direction can go differently. Now, the Arab Spring, there's a big debate about the role of social media in social change. And that debate got settled in one word, Tunisia. The Tunisian revolution wasn't caused by social media, it was caused by um, oppression. It wasn't created by social media, it was created by a new generation of young people who wanted hope. But the social media was very important in ways that people don't understand. Do you know, during the Tunisian revolution, snipers were killing unarmed students protesting in the streets. So the kids would take their mobile devices, triangulate the location of the snipers, send a photograph to friendly military units that would come in and take out the sniper. You think social media is about hooking up online? For these kids, it was a tool for self-defense. During the um, Syrian revolution, up until a year ago when things fell apart, if you were injured in a demonstration, an ambulance would pick you up, you'd go to a hospital, you'd go in with a broken leg, and you'd come out of the hospital with a bullet in your head. Assad was using the healthcare system to kill people. So these two youngsters created an alternative emergency healthcare system using Twitter. And they, you get injured, you get picked up by a van, you get taken to a makeshift medical clinic where you get medical attention as opposed to being killed. So there are lots of problems with this and I'd be happy to talk about it. But overall, this is all moving in the right direction. The train has left the station because the arc of history is a positive one. And the new media is enabling people to collaborate in new ways to bring about profound change. It's going to be difficult, but the arc of history is a positive one. Now that brings us to today. This is leading to a very profound change in the corporation. So this man here died a week ago. He was 102 years old, and um, his name is Ronald Coase. And he, as much as anyone, has been most influential in my thinking. He wasn't interested in the internet, but his ideas are key to understanding it. 60 years ago, he wrote a paper where he asked a deceptively simple question. He said, why does the firm exist? If Adam Smith is right, and the open market is the best mechanism for allocating resources and people. Why isn't everybody an independent contractor? Why do you all work for companies? And he said, the answer is collaboration costs. He said, 60 years ago, the costs of search in an open market to find all the right information or people to do something be totally prohibitive. So we bring that inside the boundaries of a corporation where we have filing cabinets to find information and org charts to find people and so on. And the big industrialists were right. They created this vertically integrated corporation that did everything inside the boundaries of the corporation. Oh, this slide is uh, its not really showing us what we need. But anyway, what happened was the internet came along and vertically integrated companies began to unbundle into focused companies. We call them business webs or business ecosystems. 
And collaboration costs are dropping so much today that peers can come together and create value. Most of you in this room are peers of each other. This is not the way that we used to create value. We create value through people working as superiors and subordinates within a company or within a supply chain. So think about it. If you can create an encyclopedia with a million people, it's uh, 20 times bigger than Britannica. It's in 240 languages. The quality is just as good, according to the big study. What else could you create? Could you create a computer operating system through peer production? Well, the Linux operating system, who knows about Linux? Knows? Okay, Linux is owned by nobody. It's in a commons. It's now the dominant operating system in the world. Now dominates mobile devices. So I'd like to end this part and we'll get into uh, marketing by telling you a story to make the point. See this guy here? His name is Rob McEwen. And the reason I know this story is he moved across the street from me in Toronto. And he held a cocktail party to meet the neighbors. And um, he said, you're Don Tapscott. I've read some of your books. I said, great, w what do you do? And he says, well, I used to be a banker and now I'm a gold miner. He's a Funny guy, he introduces his wife, he says, this is my wife, Cheryl, she's a gold digger. <laughs> anyway, thankfully she's not, and she has a sense of humor. But he tells me this amazing story. He takes over this gold mine, his geologist can't tell him where the gold is. He gives him millions of dollars to get more geological data. They can't tell him where to go into production. It goes on and on. After a few years, he's ready to give up. But he has an epiphany one day. He wonders, if my geologists don't know where the gold is, maybe somebody else does. So he did a radical thing. He took his geological data and he published it and held a contest on the internet called the Gold Corp Challenge. It's basically $500,000 in prizes for anyone who can tell me, do I have any gold? And if so, where is it? He gets 77 submissions. They come from all around the world. They use techniques that he's never heard of. And for his half a million dollars in prize money, my friend Rob McEwen found $3.4 billion worth of gold. The market value of his company went from $90 million to $10 billion overnight. And I can tell you, because he's my neighbor, he's a happy camper. What did he do? See, we think that talent is inside our boundaries, right? But the uniquely qualified minds to find gold for Rob McEwen were outside his boundaries. Now, the same thing is true for customers. Well, just before we get there. So Procter & Gamble now gets 60% of all of their innovation from outside the boundaries of the corporation. They're looking for a molecule that'll take red wine off a shirt they have 8,000 chemists inside. They have 1.5 million chemists outside. And sure enough, there's a retired chemist in Rio or a grad student in Taipei comes up with a molecule and P&G pays them and they have a new billion dollar product. The next step in these innovation ecosystems are tools like Inno360. Inno360 enables you as a consumer products company to build your own innovation ecosystem. So these are big drivers that are causing us to rethink just about everything. The other thing is now we have a burning platform. You know the idea? A burning platform? You're, you're somewhere, like on an oil rig that's on fire, you're somewhere where the costs of staying where you are become much greater than the costs of moving to something new. And we have a burning platform in the global economy. We need to change many, many things. We need to rebuild our institutions. And we have a burning platform in marketing because the old models don't work. So I understand, um, I just skipped over because I'm running late. These are uh, principles for marketing. And uh, I'm not going to talk to you about them because you're all going to get a free copy of my new TED book, or you have it already. So, and that's courtesy of Google. Thank you, Google. Google is showing great wisdom here. 
Because the best way to buy my books is in massive volume. <laughs> Christmas is coming soon. No. You look like people with friends. No, seriously. But this book talks about these principles. So what does this mean for marketing? Did anyone study marketing at university? Anybody here? Who didn't learn about the four P's? <laughs> Product, place, price, and promotion. This was the paradigm of marketing in the industrial age. It's all wrong. Almost everything about it is wrong. So let me tell you what the new paradigm is. First of all, rather than products, consumers, especially these digital natives, I'm a digital immigrant, okay? I have to learn the language. They don't want products. They want experiences. So think about whatever it is that you sell. There's pressure for you to become a commodity. But you can add greater value and create a good or a product. You can add services and create something new. You can further customize and create experiences, and you can add more value, and you can create transformation. So let me give you two examples. Uh, if you buy coffee on a commodity market, the seller of coffee gets 1 20th of a cent for a cup of coffee. But you turn it into goods and you sell it in a supermarket, you get 7 cents for the same coffee. You get somebody to make it in a coffee shop, you get 85 cents for the same coffee. You put some foamy stuff on the top and a Starbucks logo and you get $4 for the same coffee. And then you add in the ability to download iTunes that you can't get anywhere else. I wrote a book, the only place you can buy it is in a Starbucks uh, coffee shop. You create all this new value, you create a transformation where people talk about Starbucks as the third place. There's work, there's home, and there's Starbucks. Apple takes a chip, it's a commodity, they put it into a good, a product called a, I don't know, iPod. But it's just an MP3 player, right? This pressure, it's not a very good one, just pressure to become a commodity. But then it adds a service, iTunes. And then it creates this awesome marketing experience. Do you have Apple stores? In Sao Paulo, yeah. This is the one at 57th and 5th in New York. It's the nicest store in the world, I think. And uh, it's open 24 hours a day. You do that, and then you create a transformation where, um, I don't know about you, but iPod and iTunes have not only changed the way I've listened to music, they've changed my family. There's more dancing in our house now. The generations share music and so on. So don't create products. Create experiences. Now, the next thing is place. Well, physical places are still important, but increasingly we have any place. So there's a digital world and there's the physical world. Now, if you're in consumer products, supermarkets are still important. This is, I've, I've traveled all around the world. I'm, I have 200 flights a year. And, and I'm sort of interested in looking at supermarkets in every country. And I think the nicest supermarket is actually in Toronto. It's called Loblaws. And it's a beautiful, amazing experience to go in there. So you can create a place like that. But the next step, of course, is that your digital co-pilot will help you navigate around the place and it'll find specials. And it knows that you're really interested in a certain brand. As you get near it, it tells you about a special, etc. And then we have any place in the sense of YouTube now, which is soon rivaling television as a platform for uh, traditional video. Only the value is that you can create your own channels and customize messages and do all kinds of other things. There's a company called Metail, where you go, it's a clothing company, or, or it's a software company for clothing manufacturers, and you put your body up on the screen. You know, it's actually your body. <laughs> You're not naked, you always have clothes on, but, um, and then you try on all, all kinds of different clothes. And this works for the hardest thing for women. You know the two hardest things for women in an online environment? Women's jeans and bathing suits. And women have found this to be uh, effective. Online shopping for groceries 
was always a disaster. It's now starting to take off in places around the world, especially um, initially for commodity goods. Why do you go to a supermarket and lug all this heavy stuff and big things of toilet paper and so on when you can have those delivered to your house? And eventually, the geospatiality, the intersection of the digital and the virtual worlds, um, you'll be able to market to people as they walk along the street. And so you're walking along, and all of a sudden, that little red dress that you saw, I don't know, Angelina Jolie or somebody, uh, Katy Perry wearing, that you like that dress. The Gap has got that dress, and there's one a block away, and would you like them to put it in your locker? You just go in and... The, as you walk into the store, the transaction's done and you come out again. South Korea is a unique market. Tesco has been evolving itself, adjusting to the local market. It even changed the name itself from Tesco to Home Plus. And at last, it grew to rank number two in Korea. But Tesco had to overcome one obstacle, a fewer number of stores compared to the number one company, Emart. Mission. Could we become number one without increasing the number of stores? We made an in-depth study into Koreans once more. Koreans are the second most hardworking people in the world. For them, grocery shopping once a week is a dreaded task. So we decided to approach these busy and tired people. Idea. Let the store come to the people. We created this? virtual stores, hoping to blend into people's everyday lives. Our first try was subway stations. Although virtual, the displays were exactly the same as actual stores, from the display to the merchandise. Only one thing was different. You use smartphones to shop. Scan the QR code with your phone and the product automatically lands in your online cart. Okay, so you get, you get the idea there. Um, so, intersection of physical and digital. Now, Amazon, of course, is the 800-pound gorilla in this whole marketplace, and you need to figure out how to relate to them. Do you compete with them? Do you partner with them? Or do you find other platforms. This is one called shop.ca that's equivalent to Amazon, but it has a whole bunch of additional benefits. It's much more social, and this, uh, this company is growing at like 25% uh, per quarter. Uh, UPS, do you have a square yet? Yeah, it's a, little, it's a great story of these people from Digital Democracy. I met somebody last night, and I met with them in New York, and. Uh, it was a little NGO. I wanted to give them a free copy of uh, my book because they'd already bought it, so I was going to give them some money. And I looked for my wallet, and I didn't have any U.S. cash with me. So I thought, how am I going to do this? A woman says, I have a square. And she pulls this thing this big out of her purse, sticks it into her iPhone, um, swipe my credit card, a transaction's done. She sends me a receipt, including a charitable receipt. The whole thing goes down in 25 seconds. She's a full retail operation from her purse. So I thought, I gotta get a square. This is about a year ago, right? So I went down to the Apple store. I figured it'd be a few hundred dollars for cash register. And um, $9.95, you get it back after your first three transactions. <laughs> so this is physical and digital coming together. I'm running a little bit late, so I'm gonna keep moving along here. So place is any place. Um, Rather than price, we have new discovery mechanisms for price. So the idea that the seller gets to establish the price is an old idea. This began to change over a decade ago with eBay. And then you saw the, the idea of collective purchasing, where, where customers could have collective power in pricing. Then you start to see what the, is the equivalent of yield management on an airplane for price discovery in all kinds of areas. So Demure is a platform for people who have vacation homes but who love to travel. And you can swap your house for somebody's house in uh, Rio or in the, the south of France or something like that. But the houses have different value, so this, this whole complicated mechanism to um, 
to create liquidity within this marketplace. And then you get certain, uh, a, a currency really that you can use on the purchase of other, uh, a week for some other vacation property. This thing is taking off. Then exchange solutions. This would be another example where I buy something wholesale, but I pay full price for it, but I get an equivalent thing of the same value. So rather than price, we have discovery of price, and rather than promotion, we have engagement. So the final chapter of Wikonomics was a wiki. It was written by 1,500 people. Um, if you want to know how to engage people wrong, look to the record industry. <laughs> Someone takes Jay-Z's Black Album, the Beatles' White Album, and they remix them to create the Gray Album. Sales of the White Album and the Black Album go up. The record industry should be cheering. Instead, it sues the guy. This is terrible. The industry that brought you... Uh, uh, Elvis and the Beatles and Cesara Evora is now suing people as its three largest source of revenue. And the industry is collapsing. So rather than doing that, turn your customers, your consumers, into producers or prosumers, as I call them. You know this word? Consumers and producers become prosumers. Threadless is a clothing company where its customers design its products. The last time I checked, they had $70 million in revenue and 11 employees because the customers do all the work. You can even get your customers to create your advertising for you. Do you know um, the Doritos crash the Super Bowl contest? Who, who knows about this? Yeah, okay. Doritos got its consumers to create its ad. And people create 30-second ad, and if they were good, they actually ran on the Super Bowl. I'm going to show you two of them now. This ad was created by a couple of young women who were nobodies, and now they're somebodies because they created an ad that went on the Super Bowl. Paper or plastic? Paper's fine. I like these. Oh, nacho cheese. Old school. Fiery habanero? Yeah! Those are hot! Huh? Oh. Salsa verde. Oh. <laughs> Blazing buffalo and ranch? Giddy up! Gonna need a clean up on register six. Ew. Um, <clears throat> that ad ran on the Super Bowl. Now, some of them were a little edgy. As you can imagine, they never got on to the Super Bowl. But this is one of the more edgier ads that actually ran on the Super Bowl. It's one of my favorites. I mean, what, what ad agency is going to dress somebody up in a mouse suit and have them beat up your customer? But if it's the Doritos demographic, uh, that kind of works for them. Crowdfunding, unbelievable opportunity that now can be applied to marketing. This is a company called Nix Wear. Full disclosure, my daughter is one of the co-founders of this company. They're reinventing women's underwear. And it's... Uh, your underwear should do more. It's uh, multitasking, high-tech underwear. And uh, it's a long story. But anyway, they did a crowdfunding campaign where their target was $40,000 just to get interest in the company. And during the campaign, the largest retailer of women's underwear in North America saw the campaign, came in, bought up all the inventory, and they now, through a crowdfunding campaign, ended up with the biggest distribution deal that they could hope for. So product, place, price becomes discovery of price, and promotion becomes engagement. And you add in the brand. The brand is changing. The brand used to be a word in the mind. 
a promise, right? You say, things go better with Coke. Um, if you say that enough times, the brand becomes established. Well, things don't go better with Coke if Coke is being accused of having an unauthentic viral marketing campaign around Coke Zero. So Coke has had to change many of the things that it's been doing to make its marketing more effective. And Nike is a great example of a brand that with Nike um, and all of their social responsibility activity that's engaging people in the brand. The brand is not just an image. I think it becomes a relationship. And if you think differently about it, you can understand. So rather than products, we have experiences. Rather than place, it's any place. Rather than price, discovery. Rather than promotion, it's engagement. And you put those together, you reorganize them. And rather than the four Ps, we have the A, B, C, D, and E's of marketing. So just to close then, the changes that you've been talking about this morning are within the context of a profound change to the corporation and to business. And most of what we know about marketing is changing. What's your role? This is a new paradigm. And when you get a paradigm shift, you get a crisis of leadership and vested interests fight against change. Leadership for these changes does not come from the top, typically. It's got to come from everywhere within the organization. So will we have this bleak future that Krugman outlines? We don't have to. We can achieve a very different future if we want. Now, I'd like to end uh, just with a short little story, and a video, actually. I've been um, studying thousands of organizations, but I've also recently been studying nature over the last few years to look what these new organizations um, are, are forming up to be like. Fish come in schools. Could we turn down the music, please? Uh, fish come in schools. Uh, bees come in swarms. Starlings over the moors of England come in something called a murmuration. And at night, the starlings are out over a 20 mile radius. They're foraging for food. And in the evening, they come together and they create one of the most spectacular things in all of nature. The murmuration has a function. It protects the birds from predators. Look at on the right here, you see a hawk, a predator, being chased away by the collective power of the little birds. And it's called a murmuration in reference to the murmuring of the wings of the birds. Now, scientists that have studied this say they've never seen an accident. And there's leadership, but there's no one leader. Now, is this some kind of fanciful analogy? Or could you actually learn something from this? Well, this murmuration functions according to the principles that I've been describing to you today. It's all about engagement. It's a big collaboration. There's an openness and a sharing of all kinds of information about food sources, trajectory, danger. There's some rules that govern it. The big one being don't bump into anybody else. But when the moment is right, one of the most spectacular things in nature happens. Now, consider this idea, if you would. Imagine if we, in Brazil and around the world, connected ourselves with a vast network of glass and air. And we connected our brains together and began to collaborate. Could we go beyond just sharing of information to start to share our intelligence? Could we create some kind of collective intelligence that expands beyond an individual or a team or a company or a city or a society? Could we create some kind of collective consciousness? Well, if we could do that, we could solve some big problems in the world. Um, you know, during the Egyptian revolution, People said, Hosni Mubarak is too strong. He's going to crush the kids. The kids in the streets protesting, they're going to give up. They can't keep coming out every day. Eventually, they'll go home. And I wrote at the time, I don't think they will go home. I think they're going to hang in there until they're victorious. Because if they go home, 
Mubarak will hunt them down and kill them. Just like if this murmuration breaks up, then those predators can have their prey. So I look at this thing and I think about the collaborative models that we could build, a learning organization. Maybe we never achieve that because organizations like people can't learn unless they're conscious. When I give talks, I try and be interesting, tell stories, even be funny, because I find that people learn more when they're conscious. Well, maybe we need to achieve consciousness within an organization and within a marketplace and a community before we can help it learn. So I look at this thing and I th get a lot of hope that maybe this age of networked intelligence will be an age of promise fulfilled and of peril unrequited and that the, um, maybe the smaller world that your kids inherit will be a better one. Thank you very much. Thank you.